this webinar entitled Using WinEEG to Review 19 Channel EEG Recordings is presented by Jay Gunkelman and it is part of your course Quantitative Electroencephalogram as an Assessment Tool for Brain-Based Disorders. It'll walk you through how to use the WinEEG software. Anyway, we've got a uh, uh, free software uh, which is uh, downloadable, and the software is called WinEEG, and which is a Windows-based EEG product, and it allows us to process files. And uh, it, for those of you who have a dongle, you can import various files. The import function. Uh, allows us to see a wide variety of types of files. You can see a universal file, UDF, uh, CNT, which is a neuroscan file, uh, an EEG file, which is a neuroscan form of EEG file, the old Lexicore DAT files, um, ASCII TXT files, EEG 2000, and EEG monitor files. So. It imports a wide variety of old file formats, but it also has a, a more modern import for EDF Plus. And the import EDF Plus allows us to import uh, files here. Let me just pull an EDF Plus file in. The EDF Plus file lists all of the electrodes, and sometimes you'll get a, an FPZ or an OZ or a, an extra electrode set in there that are on a normal set of maps. Here, for instance, everything is linked ears, but A1, A2 we can turn off because that's a channel that wouldn't be analyzable under a linked ear montage. And at this point, I hit enter, and it imports all of that data. I rescale it, turning down the sensitivity slightly, and we see eye movements out of the frontal areas. I'm going to switch the montage to one of the reference database montages, which basically is left, right, left to right frontal, left to right temporal, left to right posterior temporal parietal, and left to right occipital. And usually left right is a, an American convention. Uh, some of the European labs use right left as a convention. So you, you can kind of see the various uh, 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 montages that are available. Uh, there, there is a large uh, list of montages that you can view the EEG in, um, and that that list is uh, visible here under view. And again, you can turn on and off various channels uh, or add channels and punch uh, channels in. But um, essentially at this point we have the raw EEG in. Uh, this is a European filtering convention. Uh, obviously this is uh, a, a a very good non-60 hertz recording. It does, however, have some electrode issues. You can see the T3 is a little bit unstable. The F8 has a small electrode pop here with no field surrounding it, so it's just the electrode. But basically, you can see the eye movements. Now, typically for QEG processing, you'd end up wanting to remove sections of the EEG, like the eye movements that we see here. That can be done manually by clipping out or erasing sections of the EEG. If you clip them out, they're not going to be analyzed, but you can still see them. If you erase them, it'll collapse this across, so this will be gone. Um, it's preferable to uh, simply mark them. Um, those marks can end up being changed uh, at another point, but if you erase it, it's irretrievable. You can see the uh, slight electrode irregularity at T3. You can also see the electrode pop at F8, another small electrode, which, which again repeats itself here, and small electrode pop at C3. And that C3 electrode uh, is, again, a, a small electrode issue. Uh, you can tell it's a single electrode because at that point in time, there's no field, there, there's no similar waveform or content in any other location. It's just at C3. And that cannot happen from inside an intact skull. If you have a generation of a voltage like this, it'll be seen at the adjacent electrodes. Uh, it'll have a, a field surrounding it. 
to the phase relationship, and that just doesn't exist. So this um, at F8 and this at C3 are individual isolated electrode pops. The, uh, the EG, you can set up to mark all of these and remove them, uh, or you can alternatively extract the eye movements, leaving the rest of the EEG basically intact. And to do that, you can, uh, again, you can mark these in, in the older way of removing artifacts and clipping them out one at a time going through. You can mark the artifacts by picking things that are bigger than 100 microvolts, and that would be just about the size of this. This is 150 microvolts in size over here. Anything bigger than 100 microvolts, any slow waves bigger than 60 microvolts between 0 and 3 hertz, that should catch eye movements, the slow co component of eye movements, and any fast activity bigger than 25 microvolts above 25 hertz and below 50 hertz. And it'll exclude 500 milliseconds before and after anything, so it'll take at least a full second out whenever it takes anything out at all. So I can mark everything that fits the, those descriptions, and it'll underline those in blue, and uh, you can adjust those to catch more subtle pieces of it. But essentially, that can be tweaked to manually remove pieces. Again, alternatively, and if we tweak this very gently uh, to catch maybe 50 microvolts and maybe 75 microvolts, um, we'll probably catch more of this eye movement. We don't catch quite as much as I would like to catch. We'll have to adjust this down perhaps even further. And again, the, uh, adjusting this slowly to catch all, all those little pieces, you can end up with an automated catch of all of the pieces that meet the definition. And again, they're, they're pieces that are being left in here that you're not going to want to leave in. But this automatically catches the bulk of all of those. This essentially ends up having a C3 electrode that's popping throughout, and that F8 electrode that popped originally has some instabilities as we go through. It's not as common as that C3 popping, but uh, a, a, a rare uh, little blip out of the F8. Now, this is the more traditional marking of pieces that you'd want to throw out. And again, we'd want to end up marking all of these to throw them out to do a good job of it. But there's another approach that's available within this free software. And that's to end up identifying all of these eye movement related components and to zero out that component so that these are extracted, leaving this piece of EEG, which other than the eye movement has got perfectly normal, healthy stuff you'd want to analyze in it. And every time you cut the EEG to splice small pieces together, you end up causing small discontinuities, which do cause impacts on the spectra. And you disturb the state of the EEG, and individuals uh, uh, analyzing for state would prefer to see intact stretches of EEG, not small atomic particles like this piece back together. So instead of doing the mark uh, pieces and extract them, I'm going to just mark a large piece of this EEG. I'm going to go from the beginning of the EEG uh, in uh, uh, a few hundred seconds into the EEG, uh, we ended up with uh, a change in probably eyes or something. There, there's a change in the mark. Anyway, I've got a big chunk of EEG selected. And I'm going to click on this. This now lights up now that I have a piece of EEG selected. And this is an artifact correction algorithm. This is a learning software. And the learning software is executed PCA, principal component analysis, originally. And the PCA, you can see, is not spatially distinct. The components aren't all easily identifiable as a spatially distinct generator. And some of these look like badly inoculated Petri dishes with little islands of stuff all over them. Now, by contrast, the independent component analysis can be done. Now, the learning algorithm is going back through the EEG 
and it's taking its time going through a number of iterations, learning the raw spectra. Um, it, it's just finished, and now you can see the generators are more discrete spatial generators. And the top one is all automatically selected. I'm going to deselect it so that we can see the display. This is the raw EEG, and we can scroll through the EEG. We now see eye movements. Uh, you can see this is the EEG corrected of any artifact that's been selected to pull out. And this top component up in the front of the head has the big morphology of these eye movements. So I'm going to select this component. This is the eye movement component. Now you can see this is the EEG minus the eye movement, which now leaves us with this T3. Remember the entire T3 had an irregular uh, baseline wander to it. That's this component. But when you select that, you also virtually flatten out the T3. So this is not always the best way to fix something, but it's done a very nice job with the eye movements. Now, if you look very carefully, there's small little wiggles here that, you know, we wanted to take out all these big things that we thought of as eye movements, but it's pulling some small things out here too. If I turn up the sensitivity on this, the eye movement has to have a field from the front to the back with this orientation. Even these small ones have that same characteristic where they wouldn't be being pulled out. The component extraction of eye movement takes out more than eye blinks. It takes out small saccadic eye movements, the little tiny twitches that the eyes do in order to actually see. If your eyes didn't move continually, you'd end up with habituation. The, the rods and cone, the input to them would habituate and you'd end up missing what the input was. You have to have small eye movements all the time. <clears throat> and the ICA being extracted super cleans the EEG, even of the small saccadic eye movements, leaving the EEG minus the eye movements. Now, as you drop down, you'll notice that there's an F7, F8 opposite of each other as a display here in the topographies. This will be lateral eye movement. And if we scroll through the EEG to the point where we actually see a lateral eye movement, uh, that we'll probably be able to identify here F7, F8 going opposite of each other. And this is the lateral eye movement component, and it pulls out the lateral component. Also, T3, T4 were going opposite of each other. The same dipole all the way back to the back of the head you can see here. So the eye movements that are being taken out include the large eye movements of lateral eye movement and all of the small saccadic movements of the eye as well. <clears throat> the, the term gain is actually an amplifier characteristic. These are display characteristics, which should be labeled sensitivity not gain, but uh, that's a very common misnomer. And other than for techno geeks that are, you know, purists, they're not going to really get their nose out of joint about that. But that is a misnomer. It should be sensitivity, not gain. And uh, again, it's changing your display, not the amplifier. Now, uh, still in all of this, we still have this left temporal irregularity that, again, if we pull it out using this, it goes as flat as a pancake, and we're, we're pulling out discrete component stuff, but we're also pulling out localized T3 activity that's local to only T3. So it, it, this is not the best way to clean up everything. However, everybody can probably recognize this little culprit here at C3, the C3 electrode pop. And that electrode pop is a discrete focal C3 component, and you can see here it is. If we select it, it takes out that C3 component, leaving quite a bit of the C3 activity. It's essentially the same as C4 here, without really damaging it too badly, but it takes out a component that's a frequent, isolated C3 blip. You can see how often it cruises through the display here as you scroll left to right, this is being pulled out as that component. And it's 
you know, unlike the T3 getting rid of that little wander, this is pulling it out as a discrete click that, that's a hit that's being pulled out. Now, it's, it's pulling this out. It's not touching the little sharp stuff that happens to be in the EEG. It's only pulling out stuff that's focal to this C3, and uh, that, that's a very, very isolated uh, component. So what these components are, are independent components that have been identified. And the PCA didn't do a good job isolating these because the PCA assumes a Gaussian distribution. And although there are people that will argue that the EG is Gaussian, and that it's actually fairly evident that it's not, um, the, the one thing I don't think anybody would argue is, is that uh, artifacts are not Gaussian in their distribution. And as such, the non-Gaussian nature of the artifact ends up being something that allows the ICA to be particularly well adapted to. And uh, it's pulling out these uh, non-Gaussian components very nicely as isolated pieces. Now, if I click OK, we can go back into the EEG, and we can see this piece of EEG that we would have thrown out here is perfectly nice. We didn't really need to throw away this bath water here to get rid of that eye blink baby. Um, and like a lot of these, now there will be some as we go through here that we probably are going to want to end up fine tuning to get rid of this T3, you know, bigger slow wave bump. But you can see the the destruction of the EEG. Now we'd again we'd want to pull some of this out because of the muscle. But there's a lot of EEG that, and here's another piece we would have wanted to throw out, and it it will be thrown out. But there's lots of it here that we would have allowed very nicely as valid, clean pieces of the EEG. So could you please show us then yeah. how, how you um, eliminate that, um, that uh, removal of the artifact, essentially taking away the blue line? All of those blue lines. We now go back up to here, and we can either rerun this, which will keep the bad pieces that still meet that definition, but it eliminates. When you, when you have this window open, here's a clear previous set of artifact intervals. And if that's checked and the artifacts are now gone, those intervals are now be cleared. Great. So running it again with that checked, this now only catches the big bad pieces that we wanted to get rid of. Now again, we can, and there's that little piece of muscle. Now there was a bigger piece off to the side that had been selected previously because of the other artifact. And the standards for EEG say I need to be able to get back my entire raw EEG again. I can't filter it to get rid of this and not get it back. I have to be able to recover it. Otherwise, I don't meet minimum standards for a clinical EEG. And if I click on this ICA component again, all of it comes back. If I change a filter, all of it comes back. But at this point, we can fine tune this because we now see that there's these subtle little ones here, and you know we can we can get this down to maybe 50 microvolts and drop this maybe to 30 microvolts, and you know the the EMG will leave at uh, uh, 20 here, and we can you know clean this up a little bit. We want to try and catch some of these little transients and the uh, the size of those and en ends up being such that you can fine-tune these again and in all likelihood this may be just a little above this 3 Hertz bottom end it may be a 4 Hertz uh, rhythm or so and we can catch that by broadening the frequency bin too but once you've got them fine-tuned to the point where you're catching the pieces that you want and you're not getting rid of, you know, pieces that you want to keep, um, at, at that point, you know, you, you've got it adjusted 
you can then do an analysis. And the analysis that we can do here will allow us to do the EG spectrum on either fragments that have previously been defined when the EG was recorded. And this one, each second is defined basically. So the fragments don't make any sense here. But sometimes people will record it and there'll be an eyes open or an eyes closed or a task or something. And you can select those predetermined fragments. In this circumstance, we can analyze the full EG or we can find excuse me, cancel this for a moment, or I can find a, a segment. Let's say I was uh, interested, if I, I thought this was a T3 was really a slow wave and I, I wanted to analyze this separately from everything else, I can catch a selection and then analyze that selection. So and you're making uh, that under selection? the analysis here, I can analyze the selection. You're, you're making that selection by I, I right made the or selection. left clicking? Yeah, I, I left mouse left. click on the timeline to catch the left edge of it, and I right mouse click to catch the right side edge of it. Okay. So, uh, it, and if I, you know, clicking down here, it, it doesn't do that. It has to be up here on the timeline. Great. So I can extend that out or shrink that down to focus on a particular piece of it. But, um, once I have the piece selected, I can end up analyzing that piece or the uh, or the fragment if it's predefined or a full EEG. You know, everything other than the pieces I have set aside, the blue underlining, it will now be analyzed. Now, um, it, I'm, I'm, I have it set for a four-second long epoch, which gives us quarter hertz resolution at the end, a very fine uh, FFT. Uh, some of the older databases only give you one second long epochs, which give you a more blunted uh, 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 view of the Fourier. And we'll, we'll take a quick look at that uh, just to let you take a peek at it. Here you can see the narrow peak. Um, you, you can see uh, the, the, the detail of some of these uh, little uh, uh, tiny pieces, the, the multiple uh, steps within the alpha peak here in the parietal area. If I turn down the sensitivity by going back to this one second epoch length, which is again the, the typical resolution, I'm, you know, I don't have that resolution anymore. Where's that nice narrow little spectral peak that was in there? So you lose quite a bit of resolution by dropping to one hertz. And as such, it's my preference if I have the ability to, to use a, a database that has a, a larger uh, epoch size. And the database uh, here, you, you'll now see we have a very narrow frequency peak here at uh, 4.8 hertz. It ranges from about 4 to about 6, but it's a very narrow little peak, and that was missing with the 1 hertz resolution. It was blended over because it, you can't get that resolution with that, you know, uh, small a, a timepiece as your, your epoch. So the added frequency resolution gives us additional insight. I mean, if you can't see that this case has a, a CZ issue here, uh, you're, you're missing the point. And that point is missing if you go to a lower resolution. And, and I just want to... displays wanna, can have a lot of change. I, I want to just step back for a second and explain how Jay got that map to happen. And as you saw, when he clicked on a particular point in the spectral, um, you got your crosshairs there. If you then right-click on your mouse, it will, oh, yeah, oh, okay, down at the bottom, thank you, down at, down at the bottom, go ahead and do a crosshair. You'll get your, um, your microvolts and then also the hertz at which that crosshair is at. Um, and you can see in your y-axis and x-axis that that would match up with that. And then and, if you right-mouse click, right mouse click at that point and then you just right. click add map and it creates a map down below of the feature that you had just isolated. Now I put the crosshairs at CZ 
it doesn't map it only at CZ, it mapped it wherever it was, and it gives us these contours around it. Now, I, I just created a, a second map the second time through. I can do the same thing for the alpha peak. Here's, you know, the 9 hertz alpha peak. Uh, and alpha has a range. It's got a, a lower edge to it. And the slower edge of alpha, you can see down below 8 hertz. That's, you know, it, it drops down below 8 hertz for the bottom edge. And the upper edge uh, goes up and gets up close to 10 hertz. So we have a range of alpha. The power of alpha is dominant at 9, but you can see it's got a range of frequency, but it's also right along the midline. So, um, and these displays can be altered. If you uh, go up under setup, under mapping styles, you can change the color scales uh, uh, for people who uh, have to print uh, into a journal that only does things in black and white. You can do uh, gray scales. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of uh, alternatives for uh, these. I like the uh, um, kind of uh, Roy G. Biv uh, 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 rainbow colors going to black uh, for absence. And that's my preference, but there's lots of uh, various color scales. Uh, red, green, blue, um, that you, you name it. So uh, some people like uh, various color scales. So pick whatever color scale you particularly like. Um, uh, the, how you interpolate between points, spherical, this is a superior uh, approach. The barycentric gives you spotty maps. Uh, you want a good high quality uh, and uh, you can draw isopotential lines and show your electrode positions or not. So uh, uh, depending upon what you want in your display, you can change what's being displayed. So it's very flexible in that respect. Um, the, the lines of contour, uh, kind of like a weather map, some people like them, some people hate them. Uh, it, they're, they're uh, I think, somewhat useful in, in uh, uh, trying to, I think, show something as being localized or, or focal in, in some circumstances, but they can also overdo the focus. Uh, in, if you've got something that's generalized but it's maximum in a spot, you can end up with a map that ends up kind of overdoing a focus. So you, you've got to make sure that you go back to the raw data, not just your maps. And this, these are the raw spectra as they were you know, pulled in. And um, uh, the, the, these raw spectra basically had, uh, uh, as we saw in the raw EEG, various frequency components to them. Now, uh, we also saw that the slow content at T3 was uh, largely artifactual. And we can do a map of uh, a slow wave that basically shows some of the slow area that ended up having artifact over here from movement and electrode issues. But uh, the mapping is uh, very flexible. Uh, let's say we were interested in the theta-beta ratio. Uh, this is a map of, it, when I select, this is the formula. Now at the bottom I have the formula. So theta above the line, beta below the line is theta divided by beta. So the theta-beta ratio, if I get this to kind of purple up a little bit, is 200%, which is 2 to 1. And a, a ratio of 2 to 1 isn't a terribly high theta-beta ratio. Although we know we had some theta at that location, there also was enough beta to keep the ratio from being very high. And here, under setup, band ranges, you have to make sure that your theta matches the theta-beta ratio theta. 4 to 8 and beta 13 to 21. That's the way to match to get theta beta ratio. If you don't have these settings proper, and, and I had to tweak these to get them to match, this uh, by default was at 7.5 alpha from 7.5 to 14 and uh, you know 14 to 20. So I had to tweak the beta 1 to match it up again to make the theta beta ratio valid according to the theta beta ratio 
in the Monastra, Linden, Lubar paper. Now, most people's definition of theta doesn't go all the way up to eight. It stops at seven, and seven or seven and a half. And uh, again, to match and get what is the theta beta ratio in the literature, you end up having to make sure that your setup file uh, matches. You can see there's a lot of flexibility here. Uh, this this can give you maps. This is big broadband maps, delta, theta, alpha, beta, one, beta, two, as defined in that setup. But we can also get uh, one hertz bin mapping uh, from, uh, and, and the default can set it starting at a different frequency. Here's four, uh, four hertz at the bottom end and uh, 20 hertz at the upper end. But you can shift those numbers around uh, uh, as you create different ones. And going with two hertz, we're going up to 30 hertz only. But again, uh, you, you can print a, a set of them for a lower and a, a set of them for a faster frequency simply by doing some user-defined uh, frequency bands. Um, and and uh, uh, even individuals interested in gamma uh, can end up having gamma uh, uh, if, if they define it uh, within that. So. Um, this gives you uh, mapping. Uh, this also gives you symmetry. The, uh, this is for asymmetry. And symmetry is left, right. And usually you adjust this with the thumb wheel to be 50%. And asymmetries 50% and greater are sometimes viewed as being more significant. And here are primary asymmetries being driven by the slow stuff that's artifactual over in the left temporal area. So. That, that wasn't anything terribly significant within this. Uh, in the display, uh, we also have uh, average coherence as a display. Uh, this is raw coherence. It goes from 0 to 1. Um, and as a rule of thumb, coherence is above 0.5 or below 0.1, tend to be outside of a normal range. And uh, uh, here we end up having uh, coherences that are at 0.37, you can see the numbers down below. You put the crosshairs on, you read the numbers down below. So this this is that slower content. Uh, here's the alpha uh, at uh, 0.291 uh, coherence. And a, a co these coherence ranges are within the normal functional uh, uh, range of, of raw coherence. Again, hypercoherence, you got to start to stick up above the 0.5 or so and hypocoherence down below 0.1. So in general, the coherences here are within a normal functional range. Not too hot, not too cold, uh, just kind of the normal amount of connectivity. Can you explain how, you know, you're saying coherence, for example, at FP1, that's where you had your crosshairs. What is it comparing it to? What is it the coherence to? Uh, this, this, is, this is the average coherence compared to all other sites. I see. If you want to do pairwise coherences, uh, 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 that is back here. Uh, FP1 uh, uh, to itself is uh, in fact an identity, uh, so it doesn't show. But you you uh, you can select an electrode and and how it's coherent to anything else ends up being seen here. Got it. But I usually, you know, the pairwise coherences, eh, you know, they're better than not looking at how something's connected. But how things are connected on the average, the average coherence is I think more like a multivariate and this is when I look at coherence this is what I look to to see whether something is over connected under connected uh, um, you know not uh, active uh, hyper coherence in alpha frontally you end up seeing a, a real big peak in alpha and you'd, you'd see the mapping of all the alpha uh, uh, being high frontally biofeedback field don't work in those areas they work primarily in uh, the, the raw spectra through the Fourier. Um, the, uh, some of the other things that are available, and I'm going to take a, a much smaller piece of this EEG for this analysis to speed it up. I'm just going to grab a, 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 about 100 seconds of the EEG. Okay, And during that chunk of time, uh, by, by making it a shorter piece of time, I'm going to now uh, run this analysis faster. I'm going to look for the components that are making up this EEG. 
I'm not looking for the components of artifact. I'm trying to decompose the raw EEG into the things that make it up. And you can de this takes time. I mean, this is a computationally intensive uh, uh, chunk of mathematics, but it's running the InfoMax ICA algorithm through the EEG, uh, hundreds and hundreds of iterations to learn this 100 second chunk of this EEG. And once it's uh, completed with its learning of the spatially uh, distinct generator patterns, um, we'll be able to then look at them uh, as components that make up this EEG. And we'll be able to see them uh, as isolated components, and we can find their generators with Loretta and all sorts of higher level of analysis. Um, and, and this is with this is you know a, a piece of this freeware uh, that that's available. So it's a very high level uh, uh, computational analysis. Um, and it, again, it, it takes time because of how intensive it it, it, it actually is, and the exact nature of this uh, specific EEG having. Uh, some faster content and a few little artifacts here and there for it to end up sorting out. Uh, as it's finished now, the, the components are visible here. Uh, their spectra are visible here. Uh, as an example, the T3 slow focus is the fourth component down, and it's responsible for What's that maybe six and a half percent of the uh, variability of the EEG. And if I right mouse click on this and do a Loretta for the component, the thing that it is generated by can end up uh, I'm, I didn't uh, uh, catch a, a good chunk of that. I'm sorry. Let me Loretta for the component. Uh, it didn't. Uh, the Loretta didn't like that, uh, and uh, it, uh, too small a, a time frame for it. But these components end up being the things that make up the EEG, and some of that will include fast activity here. There's fast activity that's being generated frontally. Uh, the, the good possibility that that may have been muscle artifact from what it looks like. Uh, there's uh, fast activity off to the left. Uh, there's uh, slower, but it's it's still fast activity, probably muscle. So you you, you basically drop down through the the various components and what it is being generated. Uh, here we have a very weak component on the total amount of variance, but it's a right temporal alpha component. And let's see if we'll get a Loretta run off of that. There we go. Um, this uh, generator ends up having this as the generator site, the superior temporal gyrus right side. And Let's say that this was a component that we were trying to get rid of, a right temporal alpha in a, an, an Asperger's autistic uh, client or something. If we had done training, this component will either disappear off the list or instead of being component 15, it will drop down the list as it becomes weaker and weaker. And it, this only is 2 point something percent of the variance of the EEG the way it is. So it's not a big component in the first place. But the, the decomposition of the EEG ends up uh, uh, identifying individual generators. Uh, here's a, a low grade of alpha with a lot of low grade slowing and it's one of the largest spatial generators and it's basically something coming off the right temporal uh, uh, area as a a focal generator. Anyway, the, this kind of software analytic is available, uh, again, under analysis. And um, the, the EG's got, uh, the, the, this EG analytic software has a lot of capability. 
uh, if you open a Windows, uh, excuse me, a Word document, uh, you can take images from this, whatever's on screen, and throw them into your Word document uh, by, by simply clicking on this W. So you can end up processing, finding something you want in your report, click on the W, it puts in, in the report. You can put a series of images in. Anyway, that gives you an idea of uh, uh, some of the flexibility and, and power uh, of this. Um, if you have an amplifier hooked up to it, it does all sorts of uh, normal amplifier things like running calibrations, checking impedances, and all that. But uh, if, if you use it as standalone analytic software, uh, you can see it's actually quite powerful. If you do have the dongle uh, and you go to uh, your uh, EG spectrum here, uh, you can end up uh, getting norms from the database as well. Uh, there's an expense associated with that um, at, at this point, so it's not something, uh, and unless you've got a dongle, uh, this won't be lit up. So um, that gives you, I think, a real quick uh, run through on some of the simple processing. One of the things I would like to point out is the ability to remontage. If I, uh, if I click on this, all of our artifacts are now back. And what I'm going to do now is to switch from a link to your reference where we can see the eye movements as all being in phase. And you can see the, all of this waveform is in phase. And in fact, when, if you're coming from inside the head, you can't all be in phase. That's one of the things that identifies this as an artifact. But uh, uh, if you s switch this over to a Laplacian montage, you'll actually see the front of the head to the back of the head. The dipole is in between the front and the back, the, the dipole of the eye. So you'll see a phase reversal front to back uh, localizing the dipole. And with a montage to an average reference, and this is the Montas selector, the drop down. I went to an average database version 2 AV. This is the, the global average. I turned down the sensitivity a touch. Now you can see in the front it's going down, in the back it's going up. It identifies that the location of the dipole is actually in the front of the head, but it's not in the front. It's you know behind the front and in front of the back. So the, the localization of the slow wave is in fact correct with the Laplace, and it's obviously uh, an, uh, an extra uh, cerebral source within the linked ear because it's all in phase, which cannot be generated from inside the head. So, uh, not, not by the brain at least. So, uh, the, the EEG here has remontaging capabilities, it's got EEG frequency filtering cap capabilities, it's got all sorts of uh, uh, fairly high levels of analysis. You can do manual extraction of uh, chunks and analyze it separately from doing the ICA extraction and uh, compare your results. You can compare results between multiple montages and actually see where things come from fairly well. Anyway, that, that's a, a quick, uh, the quick and dirty tutorial on, on how to kind of uh, get up and running uh, playing around with the WinEG software. Okay, that's great. And I am, we also have um, a little manual um, that goes along with this that um, you can access in your Saybrook um, documents file.